All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you all to our winter speaker series. We're thrilled and excited to have you join us today. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Rebecca Hauser. Um, I'm the Education and Outreach Specialist for the New York State DEC Hudson River Estuary Program. Uh, the speaker series today is the fifth series of six that we're offering this winter, focusing on women in science. Um, our next webinar will be held next Wednesday, March 9th, uh, with Ellie Carafe. Many of you know prob probably know Ellie. Um, she has recently joined the Billion Oyster Project. Uh, and Ellie will be discussing how we can reach uh, local communities by bringing more equity, access, and inclusion into our field of environmental education. So we hope you'll come back next week and join Ellie for that talk. Uh, so for today, the webinar is being recorded. Um, and if you'd like a link to the recording, you can reach out to me afterwards. I'd be happy to provide that with you. Um, if you have any questions for the speaker today, please put those questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen and um, do our best to get to all those after the presentation. So uh, today we're excited to welcome Tracy Brown. Tracy is the president um, and the Hudson River Keeper. Uh, a recognized leader in clean water advocacy, Tracy brings a multidisciplinary approach to Riverkeeper's mission, prioritizing data-driven and community-oriented strategies. Uh, she previously served as regional director of water protection at Save the Sound, establishing their New York office, which delivers based projects that protect Long Island Sound and increase community resilience. Uh, during her tenure, she established water quality monitoring programs and reporting tools that helped increase federal funding to the Sound Estuary Program tenfold. Prior to joining Save the Sound, uh, Brown worked for Riverkeeper uh, before becoming president for seven years. Uh, she was instrumental in developing Riverkeeper's water quality monitoring programs and its communication efforts. Among other achievements, she was an architect of New York sewage pollution right to know law enacted in 2013, which led to uh, the historic state reinvestment in our sewage infrastructure. Uh, a resident of Sleepy Hollow, New York, Brown is uh, one of the founders of the Peabody Preserve Outdoor Classroom, which is a nature preserve for hands-on outdoor education for the students of the Terrytown Sleepy Hollow Public School District. Uh, she has served on numerous boards and policy committees and is currently co-chair of the Water Committee for the Westchester County Climate Crisis Task Force. Uh, earlier in her career, she worked in the fields of fine art, web design, interactive media, and community organizing. She is a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. Uh, in her free time, you can find her swimming or paddling in the Hudson or hiking in the watershed. So Tracy, thank you for being here. We're thrilled to have you join us. Uh, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Mrs. Brown. All right. Thank you, Rebecca. I appreciate that. Um, warm introduction. And, um, you know, Rebecca uh, could share that when I first got this invitation from her to participate, I said, oh, no, but I'm not a scientist. Um, I don't think I qualify um, to be in this club, but um, you know, she 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 pushed me a little bit and encouraged me to um, you know talk about science from the way that I really work with it quite deeply, which is um, scientific storytelling and using science as a tool for advocacy. So um, I put together a slideshow today um, to to show that work. So I'm going to start with. Uh, just a quick overview of what I'm going to cover. So a little introduction about myself, then um, I'm going to talk about just the power of grounding advocacy work in science and data and my experience with um, with how important science is, um, especially in today's climate of uh, everyone selecting their own truths. Um, I'm going to talk about and share some examples of how um, I've seen uh, advocacy groups and specifically right now Riverkeeper partnering with scientists to get our work done. And then I'm going to show some examples of some really great um, data driven storytelling tools um, that I've been involved with for for supporting that advocacy and then we'll open it up for a discussion. 
So, um, so in preparation for this today, I, I went back to my archives and I actually scanned these old um, photos because, you know, this idea of not being a scientist, but being so interested in science. So I wanted to share a little bit of my background. You heard from Rebecca that I actually studied um, design and, and sculpture actually at Rhode Island School of Design. And, you know, I, I'm of the generation where women weren't really encouraged to go into science. Um, I did, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a classic like STEAM thinker and learner, um, but when I showed my ability in the arts, the response that I got from my teachers and my mentors at that time was, oh, you're good in the arts, so why don't you skip your science requirements and you can just take more art curriculum. Um, and I really feel like they did such a disservice um, to me in giving me that advice and I've kind of spent so much of my adult life just self teaching. Um, to address my deep curiosity um, about science and especially the earth sciences. So, I, you know, even when I was making art, this is a project, this is my first press conference ever. I think I'm about 22 in that picture. I'm the tall person on the right. Um, and this was a project that I did uh, with Keep Providence Beautiful to make these site specific garbage cans, public trash cans that had this like scientific cross section underneath the buildings the buildings were actually these were actually sited outside of buildings and then i built these little models of the actual building or the cityscape and then i had i had this kind of information graphics um on the side so you know right from the beginning i've been wanting to tell stories um with science and get people to do environmental advocacy i just came at it from from many different paths um so skip forward you heard from rebecca some of the paths that I did take, you know, I went from the arts to design and technology and eventually found my way into um, clean water advocacy. And, you know, this slide just is, you know, when I really connected with the Hudson River, I came here uh, when I was pregnant with my second child who's there kickboarding out to a little float um, at our neighborhood beach club in Sleepy Hollow. Um, and then that's me paddling on the right just a few months ago. Uh, so, you know, moved to the Hudson Valley. I really wanted to get out of design and tech and get into the environmental movement. And I was very frustrated uh, around that time that I felt like the environmental movement was not doing a good job with storytelling. And the fact that climate, I'd watched climate progressively become a political football and not just a scientific um, you know, reality and, and fact-based conversation was so deeply frustrating to me. Um, so I really wanted to take what I'd learned in storytelling and tech and communication strategy and bring it to an environmental group. So that was, that was how I first got involved with Riverkeeper. I, I joined as the first director of communications and I designed that logo on the right and I wrote the tagline and I got them on social media and I kind of helped build um, some of that initial um, infrastructure for Riverkeeper. Um, but what eventually really changed the course of my trajectory was really what you see in these pictures and the fact that, you know, as a, as a resident in the Valley, I was benefiting from the prior generations of Riverkeeper and other organizations work in making the Hudson clean again, clean enough that we could get back in it and swim and paddle, um, but not monitored and um, uh, talked about enough that we really knew if we swim, will we get sick? You know, so it, it called to us and I raised my family um, in the Hudson and I still love swimming in the Hudson, um, but the, the pursuit of the question of, you know, if I get in, will I get sick, really took me off on this um, different path to, um, to citizen science, um, which was, you know, kind of the entry point for an untrained scientist to kind of get out and start to actually pursue answers to these questions. So I was lucky to have the opportunity to work with the boat captain John Lipscomb and um, actual trained scientists and mentors from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, um, Andy Jewell and Greg O'Mullen. Um, and with them, we we conceived of and designed the citizen science study that Riverkeeper still runs today. So that's my strange path, um, uh, but wonderful path that's been uh, so rewarding to this moment. So um, so what I'm going to pivot to now is talking about the, the focus today, which is really, um, you know, my deep belief and commitment to 
um, science and data in advocacy. And when I started at Riverkeeper, um, really most of the staff were attorneys and they were still kind of fighting, you know, the big bad corporate um, entities that were polluting the Hudson. And it was very much about the Clean Water Act um, and permits and that path. And while I was there, we started to really pivot through the water quality monitoring program to bringing science more into Riverkeeper. And since that time, now we're at a point where Riverkeeper has an equal number of scientists on staff as we do um, attorneys. So it's really uh, a manifestation of how effective science-based advocacy has been. And just to highlight some of the qualities on this slide, you know, when you're when you're rooting your advocacy in science, you more quickly get to trust, um, building trust from partners and even adversaries um, for that matter when that's uh, the case. Um, it also provides organizations like Riverkeeper and Save the Sound, where I recently um, had the pleasure of working, um, a seat at the table because you are also a contributor um, to addressing environmental problems and answering questions. And um, so that's wonderful when you can have that and, and get to those tables that are doing that tactical work. Um, and also the advocacy itself leads to questions, as I'm sure many of the scientists um, on the line will know, that it actually, the work raises questions. And then we go back to our scientific partners to try and get help. Um, to move forward on our on our priorities. So um, I wanted to just quickly highlight my colleagues at Riverkeeper right now who are our trained scientists. Um, just for any of you on the line who are maybe thinking about, you know, what would it look like for you to take your skills and move them into an advocacy space? Um, cause there's, there's, you know, it's another career path and it, and it's fun and interesting. So, um, we have two women who are working directly on science right now, Jen Epstein, who's been leading our water quality monitoring work and Katie Lung, who actually came because she's been doing more, um, kind of pure science, um, and laboratory science and wanted to really get to the human side. So she came to kind of round out her experience as she told me not to speak for Katie, um, but she told me that, you know, she's she's spending time at Riverkeeper now to to interact with the public and see about how that science and her knowledge kind of hits hits the ground with the regular folks. Uh, and then we have George Jackman, who is our um, fisheries biologist and Bill Wagner, who's been with us for a long time. Um, who's a biologist who helps a lot with a um, uh, lot of research and work around water quality, both drinking and recreational. So in addition to our staff scientists, we partner with a whole variety of scientists in the course of doing our work. And so I have some examples to share with you about um, how those collaborations are really, really supporting and advancing our our goals in a very meaningful way. So um, I have three types of interactions. One is um, working with the scientists um, actually where they identify issues that we then get to pick up and follow up. Um, second is work, working in direct partnership um, to answer questions that we have around our advocacy goals. Um, and then um, scientists you know picking up on questions that we raise that there aren't answers to yet where we actually need additional research and follow-up so the first example um is this one and uh the uh it's the invasive species issue um which has both you know marine um element uh, in terms of fish and also um aquatic invasive. So just by way of examples, got a picture here of the round goby, um, which has recently made its way to the Hudson by way of the Erie Canal system, um, and water chestnuts, which also are an emerging problem on the Hudson. So this issue, um, actually the issue of the, um, the round goby and also specifically um, the Asian carp, which are currently a big threat that we are trying to keep um, out of the Hudson from um, breaching that Erie Canal like the Round Gobi did. And we were alerted to this actually when we read an op-ed in the New York Times called um, Beware the Maroding Carp, um, 
that was published by prominent um, Hudson River scientists. And I'm sorry, I don't have their um, their names in my notes here. I thought that I did, um, but definitely scientists that we work with. And um, it very much caught our attention um, that this was an issue. And we were able to reach out to those scientists, get more information and raise this as an issue at the state level. Um, and now New York State DEC is uh, engaged in this issue. Uh, they have a committee and a five-year action agenda specifically for the Mohawk Basin. And um, we are working together um, with our colleagues at DEC to address this issue. And there's a proposal, um, Reimagine the Canals initiative um, that's out there. And um, thanks to the scientists alerting us to this issue, um, this is one of our priority um, campaigns right now to protect the Hudson. And, um, you know, if we didn't have that, that, uh, that kind of folks looking far down the line to tell us things that are coming, you know, it's much easier, obviously, for us to plan and tackle things before they're upon us. And um, in that way, scientists are, are hugely valuable um, source of, of priorities and knowledge for us. So then the second example is, um, you know, support from scientists to answer really critical questions. So um, we are having an issue with the Atlantic sturgeon. Um, uh, their numbers are declining and our marine scientist, um, George Jackman, who I mentioned before, is really looking at this, air, at this issue and concerned. And we're working on um, a multi-pronged strategy to try and uh, support the Atlantic sturgeon and keep them from, uh, you know, getting to the endangered species species list and perishing. So this is a area where we actually are working actively with scientific partners and, um, you know, regularly combing research um, and reaching out to scientists directly that have information that can help us try and figure out what are the main stressors on this species so we can really target our advocacy based on data and the science that's out there um, and not waste our uh, limited resources, um, you know, focused on the wrong sources and stressors. So that's a critical collaboration. And we've actually learned, you know, one of the things that's important for folks who are doing this kind of research and, you know, are working maybe in academia or in a lab and don't have direct partnerships with groups like Riverkeeper or Save the Sound. Um, you know, it's so important that you publish your materials in a place that's that can be found with a Google search. I will say uh, groups like Riverkeeper do not have paid subscriptions to academic databases. We really are using um, search engines, um, but we have learned that when we find just an abstract for a paper that we can uh, then reach out directly to the author with an email and usually um, they'll be happy to just send us a PDF of their full um, work product if we're not able to access the, the publications. Um, but just making sure that the work that you have can be found with some kind of a search and that there's contact information for you if you want to be supporting um, conservation measures, uh, that's really important. And then um, the third example, so this is an emerging issue and this is a call for help. Uh, we need science um, and research on this because this is an issue we know is coming from climate, but we don't yet know how fast and um, what to prepare for. So this issue is um, because of uh, climate change, the salt wedge in the Hudson River is going to be migrating north. And we have seven communities at, starting at Poughkeepsie and going north that actually um, get their drinking water intakes from the Hudson. They're drinking Hudson River water. And when the salt wedge gets to the point where it starts to more um, intensely interact with their drinking water source, there will, there will be impacts to the pipes and there'll be requirements for upgrades at the treatment plants. So this is an investment that we're trying to anticipate and for us to be able to lobby and make sure that there's funding for these communities to have secure drinking water supplies and not run into the problems that they had in Flint, Michigan, which was also um, triggered by uh, increased um, salinity in the drinking water supply. Um, for us not to have that same problem, we need science and we need modeling to tell us, you know, how fast is this going to happen um, so we know what the window is and then we can take that to our elected officials and our state representatives and make the case for, for funding to help those communities prepare. 
So, um, so now I'm going to pivot to talking about our citizen science program. Um, so in addition to our staff scientists, and then the partners that we actively work with and the scientists out there that maybe we don't actively work with, but whose work we read and study um, and use um, to support uh, priorities that that it informs. We also have this other category, which is the citizen scientists. Um, or what what I like to call also community scientists. So um, we have this giant network. This map shows basically the Hudson River watershed and then highlighted the sub watersheds where we're doing monitoring on those tributary streams and brooks. Those are the, the colored sub watersheds. So um, with our network, we are covering the majority of the Hudson River watershed in terms of looking at tributaries and streams. Um, we have 16 rivers, creeks, and different waterfront locations where we have projects, 400 sites that we go to repeatedly um, every season. We go once a month from May through October to collect um, enterococcus samples at these locations. And we average, you know, non pandemic years, um, about 5,000 samples a year. So here's one of our um, volunteers. We have over 150 volunteers in an average non-pandemic season, and um, we have over 50 partners. So we work with universities, with uh, municipalities, so towns and villages and counties, and then a whole variety of community groups um, and funders. So <clears throat> what started as something that was uh, Riverkeeper partnering with Lamont Doherty scientists to get them out on the water using our, our vessel and sharing information with them and learning what they were doing around fecal bacteria monitoring, then transformed into us publishing that information, people in the community saying, oh, well, what does this mean? And what does it look like in my reverse stream? What does it look like on my waterfront? And then supporting residents to start to get that information for themselves with the support of our resources has since blossomed into numerous labs, um, numerous partner groups. Um, so now it's more of kind of a network of monitoring groups um, using their own labs and using their own resources. And uh, Riverkeeper continues to provide training and publication of the data. And, um, and we use the data to support our um, anti-pollution and uh, infrastructure investment um, priorities. So it's become one of our signature programs and I'm really, really proud to be involved with it. And then that program then of course also begets other initiatives. So success begets success. This is just one example of um, one of our partner groups, the um, Newberg Clean Water Project. Um, in this community, we have expanded from in addition to kind of getting there and building relationships around fecal bacteria and wastewater issues, then we started to learn about other water quality issues in this community. So we've since gone on to work in Newburgh on contamination to their surface drinking water reservoir. Um, and we're also working with them on dam removal and river connectivity um, to help with their with their flooding issues. So. Um, it's just an example of what I started with this idea of building trust um, and building partnership um, that when you come in with something that's about science and empowering people to better understand their environment. In this case, you know, we had a program and a question we were looking to answer, but once we heard from community partners what their questions were and what some of their needs were, we've been able to um, adapt and, and offer more resources and, and more support. Um, an expertise for what what they what they are struggling with, um, and of course, drinking water, you know, trumps everything in terms of you know if you don't have clean, safe drinking water, there's not much else you can really focus on. It's one of those basic human needs. So, um, so very happy to be working with the community in Newburgh and and our other partners. So that brings me to my final section, and then we can open it up. Um, for questions and discussion. So finally, you know, communicating with data and, and database storytelling kind of full circle for me, um, back to what 
my roots are in in this work and one of the things i really enjoy um about science is the science storytelling the data graphics so i'm showing some examples of work that i did while i was at save the sound um save the sound is really uh strong in doing these report cards these long island sound report cards so what you see here is just two examples on the left is um a report card that really looks at the ecological health of Long Island Sound and the spread on the right is an insert um, from one of those reports, actually the 2018 report. And then next to that is one of the beach reports um, that Save the Sound does. So they they release these in alternating years. And, you know, in a lot of ways, you're getting at the same issues. You know, it's sewage and stormwater runoff. Um, that will make your beaches close as well as give you harmful algal blooms. Um, but by but by having different types of data sets and different ways of telling the story, you reach different audiences. So you amplify the message by um, doing one that's ecologically based and one that's human use based. So um, I wanted to show this example on the right because it's such a good uh, uh, exemplar of how the data can really reinforce and support the advocacy work. So in this case, Long Island Sound has a federal estuary program and um, starting around, I think it was 2012 or 10, I wanna say, um, after 2008, around that time, um, they had a, uh, an EPA mandate to reduce nitrogen entering Long Island Sound from the wastewater treatment plants. So the EPA federal program made available a lot of federal dollars through the estuary program over a number of years for um, investment in nitrogen treatment and removal at wastewater treatment plants all around the sound. And the main target was the F and the D you see there in that graph. Um, in the far western sound. So that's an area where Long Island Sound has um, hypoxic dead zones um, that pop up um, in the warm weather and massive fish die offs. Um, so the main goal of EPA's um, nitrogen TMDL, total maximum daily load uh, requirement on nitrogen was to reduce to re reduce the size and the extent of that hypoxic dead zone. So when we started doing the Long Island Sound report card, we were able to use longstanding data, monitoring data collected by Connecticut State, New York City, and the Interstate Environmental Committee uh, Commission um, to show a trend over time. So they'd been doing this work and doing their reports and doing great reports, um, you know, targeted for kind of agency folks. And Save the Sound just kind of boiled it down a level simpler with um, your classic report card that everyone knows what an A is versus an F. We all have been raised on um, A, B, C, D, E, F grades, and we've all been raised on green, yellow, red uh, traffic lights and what those mean. So taking that very simple, um, um, quick, quickly digested way of presenting the information, we we're able to show that starting with when the problem was happening and then skipping forward a decade after this federal investment was made that that there was a return on that investment and that that water quality really improved quite a bit um, going from a d plus to a b minus um, and from a b to an a minus and when we um, publish this report and then have a press conference and bring the senators and the congressional reps and the state officials they get really excited everyone loves a winner and um and they have a chance to kind of do a victory lap and say, yes, you know, I, I lobbied for this money. It's making a difference. I get credit for this. And then as advocates, um, we also get to say, but there's also X, Y, Z to go. Look at New York City. It still has an F. And um, we don't know what's happening in the bays and harbors yet. And we need money for that. And, you know, you set up your next round of um, of actions and and get their support because they're quickly getting the story that they're spending money and they're getting a return on investment. So since uh, the beginning of doing this report carding work, um, the federal funding for Long Island Sound's EPA uh, estuary program has increased tenfold. So a pretty dramatic, uh, great return on investment. 
And then um, this is another tool that I'm proud to have worked on while I was working on the sound. This is called the Sound Health Explorer. Uh, I encourage everyone to go to soundhealthexplorer.org after the presentation and, and have a look at what's in here. It's a, um, it's a website that is dynamically pulling from some live databases and that also has uploaded information. So dynamically, it is getting the beach monitoring data out of the EPA WQX database and signing with a scoring system that we wrote annual grades for each of the beaches, uh, over 200 beaches on Long Island Sound. Those are the dots that you see. Those are all beach grades. And this is the view from the 2019 um, swim season. Um, it also has static information that we put in, like locations of combined sewer overflow outfalls. You can look at watersheds. You can find where boat launches are. Um, the idea is to combine some recreational public access information so people will come to it to say oh I want to go swimming or I want to get to a boat launch and there's something that is useful for them to get there and then once they're there you provide information around problems advocacy actions that they can take um, to address water pollution. Um, so it's been really effective I have one more screenshot that's a close up. So let's say your beach is Shady Beach in Fairfield, Connecticut. You can go to that site, click in on that beach, see what the grade is, see if it's you know a wet weather, or dry weather failures, read about the beach. Um, and then there's actually, um, this is only a screenshot, but there is information on um, you know all of the background data, charts, tables, and then an opportunity to see what are the possible causes? If there is a pollution issue here, then there's some actual actions um, that you can take that the site provides for you. Um, so we're really in this effort um, at Save the Sound and also with um, with Riverkeepers publications, you know, we're trying to take just how the scientists are empowering us with their data. Um, and we have experts that can read academic papers and, and understand it and, and turn it into something actionable. Then we kind of take that pre-digested information and pass it to the lay person and make it, you know, kind of water and simplify down that little bit more so that they can, we're connecting where they are, which is just, you know, might just be why is my beach closed today? Or what's that weird green color in my pond? Um, so we're kind of an intermediary um, and sometimes it's our data and sometimes it's data that is publicly available that we are just presenting in a, in a new way. And then finally, this is the Riverkeeper um, current website that shows all of our monitoring data um, in, on the Hudson. So on the left, you can see our main stem data and it is color coded also with the with the red and green. This one doesn't have the yellow of the stop sign, just the red and green for um, swimmable, swimmable, not swimmable. Um, and then this one shows you if you look at all the tributaries and streams. And these, this is also just a snapshot in time as an example, but I encourage everyone to go to riverkeeper.org um, and click around and look at this data. We are, this coming year, we're gonna be redesigning um, the riverkeeper.org website. So there's a lot of opportunities um, to do more, more with data visualization and that that core competency and part of our work, um, you know, continues to grow and we'll, it will definitely be um, centered as a highlight in the redesign. So that that is my, uh, that's my story. Um, thank you folks for coming out and spending some time um, this afternoon, and I'm really happy to um, answer any questions and hear people's feedback. All right, thank you. And thank you, uh, Leah and Katie for putting those links in the in the chat button. Um, so Christopher Bowser would like to know, um, what's your favorite place along the river or watershed? <laughs> Oh boy. Oh gosh. So many good places. Um, oh, my favorite <laughs> place. Jeez. Um, well, you know, I mean, Boscoville just has kind of the view to die for. So that's always breathtaking to look at the Hudson from that view. I love Hook Mountain, where you can kind of look down to the city over one shoulder and then up, um, up the river to the other one. I mean, there's just countless 
great places, but I am a big open water swimmer. So, um, you know, I also, I love to paddle off of Kingsland Point Park and swim illegally where the boats raft up um, off of the park. That's also a, a, a big favorite. We need more swimming beaches on the Hudson. Agree. <laughs> yeah. It'd be fun. So um, those of you who are, okay, well, actually all of our participants are still here. It'd be fun to see what, if they put in the chat, what their favorite place in the Hudson River or the watershed is. And maybe somebody will find some place new to explore. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, you know, Croton Point Park's another like beauty and they, yeah. they have a good um, legal swimming spot there, um, which is pretty nice. Kawawisi, yes. One of my favorite spots along the river to take my kids to beachcomb. Um, so Jackie would like to know what methods or PR did you use to recruit schools, universities, municipalities, and other groups? For the food science, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, I should probably. So I do have a gap in my Riverkeeper knowledge, right? So I started, I was with Riverkeeper at the very beginning of that program from, you know, the 2007 to 14. And then I went to the Sound and started a similar program from scratch. Uh, so, but I can speak to those two periods. Um, I will say with Riverkeeper at the beginning, when we were starting the program, you know, the first round of people were the people that came to us and found us. So it was, you know, publishing the main STEM data through, um uh, a nice report and then i have to say you know the key ingredient press conference you know have, write a report but have a press conference get the press to come give them a photo op so that it gets out to the wider audience in newspapers and television and radio and websites and that's where you really reach the most people and new people so that was what we were doing on the hudson and that brought us um uh, a few folks who were already very engaged in water. And it was interesting because a lot of people, including myself at that time, were under the false impression, just based on the stories about the Hudson and its history of pollution, that our tributaries were cleaner and better for swimming in than our Hudson River waterfront. And the findings of Riverkeeper study really turned that on its head. And because our stormwater systems you know, discharge mostly into tributary streams and creeks, those are often, you know, de facto point sources of pollution to the waterfront and getting away from the streams and creeks, um, sadly, is your is your best bet. Um, and there are many good places where the Hudson River water um, is good, especially not near the mouth of a, of a tributary. Um, but that wasn't your question. So with those, those, that first round of folks really came to us um, and I think the first group that really kind of said, we're going to do this on our own and set up our own lab and be kind of an equal partner was the New York City Water Trails, um, which is a group of um, paddling enthusiasts who very quickly said, we want to be doing that down here. They already had a network of people because they paddled. So they had a network that organized around events being on the water and they, and they were able to find a lab in the city river project. And pretty quickly with just some um, training and um, several meetings um, with John Lipscomb and myself um, set up their own program and were, were publishing data and they're still go, going strong. Um, other, organizations and partners need more hand held, holding and cajoling. Um, I'll say at Save the Sound, you know, definitely working with students is some low hanging fruit. You know, high school students are great because they all want something for their college resume um, and they're eager to come and do some volunteer work. The downside is they turn over a lot. So your better relationship is with the teachers or the um, college advisors. So at Save the Sound, um, we started building our network around, um, it was mostly high school students and then sometimes college students home for the summer and then you would kind of jump right to retirees. So it's kind of, it ends up being a nice intergenerational workforce because the retirees are, are out and volunteering in the world. And then to get those more kind of established partners, um, it takes you know a little more training on the on Long Island Sound. We had there's a big study called the Unified Water Study. 
um, that has a network of over 24 partner organizations doing the ecological monitoring that Save the Sound coordinates. And um, they actually have a federal grant uh, through EPA. So that is a nice model if you can have it be funded and you can have a program where you offer equipment, training, data publication, and you cover the expenses of people doing the study. Um, uh, that's a really great model if you have the luxury of funds. Otherwise, you know, it's volunteers and it's um, just kind of finding the the uh, the allies, the, the useful allies, um, the willing folks. Um, next question, are there specific areas to volunteer or learn more about, you know, Warriors Park, Nori Point, etc.? Yeah, so we do, um, like I said, I showed the picture with all of the um, tributaries. So we are always looking to refresh our citizen science volunteers. So um, there's usually a little bit of attrition each year as people graduate or move or get a different job. So um, please um, go to the Riverkeeper website. There's a volunteer form you can fill out and the recruitment will start up again in May for this coming season. Um, and we can also direct you, depending on what part of the watershed you're in, um, to other partners that we know who might be doing this kind of monitoring um, close to you. So yes, always looking for for more partners and volunteers. And I think I can also say that for my friends and colleagues at Save the Sound. Um, they just do the citizen science monitoring from Greenwich, Connecticut through Westchester and into Queens. But anyone who lives in those communities um, should reach out um, to them and anyone in the Hudson Valley. Um, please reach out to Riverkeeper. Yeah, um, we also through the DC Hudson River program, we also have some volunteer opportunities. Um, one of them being our community science eel project, which is going to be starting up. Well, it has already started up. So that's something that we're, you know, we're always looking for volunteers to help out with. Um, we also have a, a, a new program we've been running for the past couple of years called TIDES, which is the Institute for Discovering Environmental Scientists. Um, we run a two week, uh, pretty intensive research oriented program over at Nori Point. It's for high school and college students. Um, they do get paid, which is great. It's minimum wage, but it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. um, work with myself and Maya Nemesto and Sarah Mao and Chris Bowser and some of our other educators at Nori Point um, to really get some um, hands on science. So they learn about the river and then they come up with a science or a science research project. They get to work with researchers from around the Hudson Valley, um, some within the DEC, some outside of the DEC. Um, so yes, I can definitely send um, that information to you, Adrian. Um, the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, Lamont Doherty, they also have very similar programs for students um, and volunteers to get involved in as well. So um, just reach out to me. I will put my email in the chat. Um, if you don't already have it, and then I'd be happy to send anything along. Uh, Margie would like to know, how does Riverkeeper balance supporting emerging issues as well as longstanding programs through support? Yeah, that's a tricky, that is a tricky balance. And actually we are internally uh, going through a review of that right now. Um, and uh, we are looking at probably updating some of our water quality monitoring as one, just a, a great example of what's become a really core program. Um, but you do have to ask yourself, you know, periodically, okay, we've been doing this. We've had great outcomes in raising the issue of, um, you know, disrepair to our sewage infrastructure and the impacts ecologically and human health wise to um, sewage overflows and sewage sewer leaks. Um, but at what point do we say now we, there's new questions? We have new questions. And certainly we're at a point now with climate impacts um, and the declines we're seeing in fisheries and the pressure to harden our shorelines um, to prepare for climate. You know, it's raising new questions. So we are internally in a process right now of saying, are we still answering the most critical question? Because we do only have so many resources. So, you know, there's always the, Okay, we're going to hire five more people and then we'll, you know, we'll add this and add this and add that. Um, 
but the reality is, um, you know, there's, it's not a fast growing um, space doing this environmental work. So we do have to be very strategic um, and, and really work with partners as much as we can um, to leverage outside expertise and also to kind of crowdsource problems um, and labor. You know, honestly, the citizen science work is wonderful because, um, you know, people help with the labor and they get something out of it. They enjoy the experience. We get something out of it. And then the whole community benefits from, from all that insight. So it's an on, it's an ongoing conversation. Um, but I think the only way you really can do it is you do have to, at a certain point, retire, retire work that has achieved your outcome or that at least has successfully got its own legs that it's going forward on its own. Some of our work is also standing up partner groups. So we've Riverkeeper stood up many partner organizations, you know, on Newtown Creek and Guanas Canal, and now working with a group up in Troy and elsewhere. So um, part of it is also when you can stand up another group that then can take over and you can step back. That's a very helpful model for continuing to make space for emergent problems, which just keep coming despite our best efforts. Okay, we have a, just a couple more questions. Um, I saw one in the chat, so I'm just trying to find it again. Oh, okay. what about fish abundance? Oh yeah, as the water quality has improved, have you seen specific fishery abundances increasing such as stripers and do you have any data backing up that? And is that available to the public? <laughs> so sadly, we do not have good news on fish abundance in the Hudson. So, um, you know, this is an area that we are looking to dedicate more resources to. And we have added, you know, to Margie's point, um, and thanks to Fran Dunwell and her team, um, uh, we have been, a, been able to add a dam removal expert, George Jackman. I showed his picture earlier um, because dams are certainly one of the biggest problems to. Um, our fish population um, and stressing them and, and hurting their abilities to um, uh, to reproduce. So not a lot of great news on the fish. Um, I think the one highlight is that the Manhattan have been coming back and the Manhattan largely seem to be coming back because there's been meaningful regulation to limit bycatch um, with these big um, commercial fishing um, operations off in the Atlantic seaboard. Um, so now that 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 has really been um, properly addressed by regulators, we're getting more Manhattan, we're seeing or some people call them bunker. Um, uh, there was that die off a couple of years ago where they uh, looks like they contracted a Vibrio um, uh, that created some die off, but also it was partially so visible because we had so many more of them. Um, again, um, so they're, they're the good news, you know, we're, we're trying to do work around um, offshore um, bycatch issues that are impacting other Hudson River fish um, and doing the, the dam removal and working on habitat um, protection, but certainly the warming uh, is something that we don't have control over and that's um, stressing a lot of our fish and the sea level rise are you know making some groups like the army corps want to come in and 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 fill in more habitat with you know hardened shoreline and and sea gates so it's really um we're really at a critical moment of needing to get very serious about what we're willing to um, sacrifice to spare communities from flooding um and i'll just share one more thing on that which um the what I've learned from George recently, um, and he wrote a blog on this. I bet I bet Leah will throw it in the chat if I ask her to, on um, the fact that the freshwater fish are the um, are the class of um, life on Earth that are suffering the most in this mass extinction that we're going through. That we're seeing like a real dramatic loss, specifically in freshwater um, species. So, um, so it's a, it's a real, it's a real crisis. And that's why um, I shared the sturgeon image before, you know, we're really looking to the scientific community to help us understand as best we can, 
which of these um which of these impacts are are the deadliest for this wildlife so we can really target our efforts there's the blog thank you leah um what has been the most surprising thing to learn about the public when interacting with your audience during citizen science programs <laughs> i'm i just kind of the total lack of awareness about anything relating to water pollution and i'll tell you one of the really interesting things is um people have this idea that there's like this huge government presence that's just out there protecting us from everything people are like stunned for example that that um, beaches are only monitored once a week they think that their beach is like the pool at the y and there's someone's out there with like a little you know a dip a dipstick you know checking it before they get in to make sure it's safe or the fact that the monitoring happens the day before um and you don't know until the next day um if you are swimming in sewage um so there's just there's this there's a little bit of an illusion around how big and omnipresent um government is and how much it's protecting us um and then at the same time that kind of distrust it's a weird um dissonance where you you're kind of distrusting government but also assuming government is a paternalistic um you know um protector on all fronts so i think i think americans are getting um disabused of that um assumption as we see things like um you know pfas chemicals and realize that in truth the american public is more like guinea pigs for industry and the government very much is in a lag position kind of coming in way after the horses are out of the barn for the most part um trying to then clean things up it's a cleanup operation it's not a protection operation so i think that's probably the biggest disconnect between what i know doing the work and what people out um in the field um assume um all right i think this is our last question do you have observations about differences between data from professional versus citizen scientists yeah wow a, question, a, <laughs> yeah there's a that's a big challenge and issue so um certainly you know especially in new york state um we had you know citizen science is really sadly discounted um, in other states, it's not as discounted, um, like Connecticut, for example, takes Save the Sounds monitoring data and will use it to inform um, impairment listings and um, do follow up monitoring and New York State does not do that for the same data collection processes on the Hudson from Riverkeeper. Um, so you know, depending what state you work on and how willing they are to look at citizen science and support, you know, quality citizen science efforts, you have very limited opportunities um, in terms of using it for uh, state state level action or enforcement. But I think the main power of it really is connecting with the public. And it's both um, connecting with the public by sharing the data and telling the stories, the fact that you can be hyper local in a way that the state agencies can't just because they have a huge um, territory um, to cover. So the citizen data is really great at kind of stepping into data gaps and answering questions. Um, I feel very confident in what Riverkeeper does um, because I know, you know how we do it and that we have standard operating procedures and and co-op, so I don't worry about the quality, but certainly, you know, generally all data is better if you have more of it. Um, so collecting more regularly and for a longer period of time, you know, kind of shakes out, um, you know, the anomalies here and there. But of course, there's quality insurance, um, uh, QA, QC, quality insurance, quality control that happens. So if there is some data that comes in that looks like an outlier, you know, it's assessed and things just don't go, um, you know, right out to publication. So I think that's to say that, you know, it's up to the integrity of the group that's doing it. You certainly don't want to overstate the data. And, you know, when you're trying to work from a place of integrity and protect a, you know, good reputation, um, 
you know, you let the data talk for itself, make sure the data has integrity and let the data talk for itself and make it transparent and, and put it out in open source um, areas. And I think that's the best you can do. And some people will just discount it because it's citizen science and won't look at it out of the gate. Um, but other people will just be so grateful to have data that talks to their community and their experience where there are no other sources and they will grab it like a lifeline um, to better understand what they're experiencing or seeing or figure out how they can take action um, locally. So it goes both ways. Yeah. Um, well, great. Thank you, Tracy. I don't, if anybody has any last minute questions, you can quickly type them in the chat or in the question answer. Um, but Tracy, I just, um, thank you so much again for joining us today. It was, uh, I'm glad you took the time out of your day to, to, to come and speak with all of us. Yeah, my pleasure. And thank you for letting me um, hang with the cool scientist crowd. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, because yes, I'm, um, I'm the unrealized um, steam, um, steam person here. So but but I got there eventually. <laughs> <laughs>